Welcome everyone to our final session of this year's Photographers uh, Spotlight. So we've had some incredible conversations with a lot of beautiful contributors to Prince for Wildlife. And uh, today I'm joined by Matt Todd, who is not only a photographer, but also works as, uh, or works, <laughs> let's say serves as director of uh, African Parks UK. So today is all about uh, getting to know more of African Parks work. So thank you so much for joining, Matt. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for hosting me, Marion. And again, thanks so much for what you and P have done with Prince for Wildlife. It's such a truly inspirational campaign. So it's uh, great to be able to join you again as a contributing photographer, but also to speak to you and everybody else. So thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Matt. Uh, lovely to have you. And uh, also, please, guys, feel free to use the chat. I see a few of you have already uh, sent messages where you're from. So Rob is joining from Amsterdam, Silke from Bonn. Silke, nice to see you again. Carl Heinz, also nice to see you again from uh, Bavaria. Uh, so nice. I think you guys really, you were there for every session. So <laughs> you got the full package. And today um, you have the chance to uh, learn more about, you know, what Prince for Wildlife actually contribute, contributes to. So what African Parks does, of course, I know it only a tiny part about it. And Matt can really give us a more broader picture about their mission, their work in uh, 20 parks in 11 countries in, in Africa. So Matt, uh, to introduce you a bit more, uh, you're from Australia originally. Now you're based in London. You just told me since longer than you expected, <laughs> you wanted to stay for just two years. <laughs> now it's been a Yeah, it's true. If you know, come over for university, you think it's going to be three to five and suddenly it's, you know, 25. So time flies when you're, you're having fun. <laughs> exactly. And uh, Matt uh, set up the, the board and the uh, kind of the activities of uh, African parks in London, in the UK. So it will be quite interesting to hear his perspective on what African parks does. Again, feel free to, to ask any questions. And uh, Matt, please go ahead. I know you have prepared a lot of incredible stories and also some beautiful photos uh, along. So, uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead and kick it off. <laughs> I'll start by sharing my screen because I think it's always nice to have some uh, images to, to join us as we, we chat along and, you know, really want to make this engaging. So to the extent anyone is um, has questions, would like to ask any questions, same for you, Marion, please just feel to, to interject and happy to take them along the way. But I thought I'd start with, uh, with my contribution from the Prince for Wildlife initial inaugural edition in, in 2020. And, this was one that P and Marion took, unfortunately not from an African park park, but uh, from the Serengeti. And it was great to be to be part of this this campaign from from the very beginning. And I don't think any of us fully appreciated what it would would lead to and, and how much support it would provide for African parks. And it was obviously trying times with with COVID and really just again a truly inspirational campaign. So let's uh, let's take it from there and chat really a little bit more about um, African parks. And as Marion said, we are today 20 parks across 11 countries that covers almost 17 million hectares. So that is a lot of territory, but it is also a very uh, thought out sort of strategy. This is a, a model where African parks really wants to identify key ecosystems and biomes where protection is, is perhaps lacking, is undermanaged, and where African parks and the model that they employ can really provide a, a key benefit. Um, I've not been to all of the parks. I've almost been to all of the countries on the, on the list where African parks is present, but so far I only visited four of the parks, so Zakuma, Odzala, Bazarutu, and Matusidona, and I'll share some photos from, from those areas. Um, can you but quickly? Point, uh, point out where they are on the map to give people an idea. I think not all of them probably know where these parks are. Yeah, no, definitely. So, I mean, and it, it looks like a lot of territory. Obviously, these are not all, all of this land is not uh, all of, uh, all under African parks management, but mm -hmm. each of the parks is under African parks management that is listed there. So, the so Kuma is, is sort of up in Northwest Africa in, in Chad. Um, mm -hmm. Zala, uh, sort of towards the west of Africa in the Congo Basin. Uh, then you have Bazarutu on the east coast of Africa, uh, the southernmost uh, park on the map, and that is African Parks' only marine uh, national park. And then Donna in Zimbabwe. Uh, but yeah, you have uh, you know presence through 
Malawi, Zimbabwe, Angola, uh, into uh, Zambia, Rwanda, and Marion, you've, you've visited the, the two parks, which are high on my list to, to travel to there in, in Rwanda, the DRC, Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and then, you know, stretching into West Africa in, in Benin as well with two parks mm -hmm. in Jari. So com completely different biomes, completely different endemic species. It's uh, very varied, right? That is, that is exactly the case. There is some overlap in terms of some of the, the biomes. I mean, I think between Chinko and, and Panjari, for instance, and W, you know, some of the species are overlapping and, and similarly into, into Zakuma. Um, and mm -hmm. so African Parks has, has been involved and was planning translocations with some of those species. Um, but yeah, they are a key element of, of what African Parks is trying to do is to protect those intact and, and you know, identify environments and ecosystems where their model can really be most uh, most successful and really provide benefits to both you know the, the the people of those countries and also the the wildlife within yeah which is i think the core of african parks right that these two elements are always interlocked and intertwined that it's a community based conservation model where really people are put at the heart of the solution that is exactly the case. And I think that's a, a key element is really the, the public-private partnership model that African Parks has, has taken on. And, and I'll come on to that as, and maybe if I sort of go to the, the next image, yeah. my first taste of, of African Parks, I knew it by name, I knew it by reputation, but I had not been to any of the parks. And, and that changed in 2017 when I had the chance to visit Sakuma. And it is a mind-blowing place. I think many of you will have heard from Michael Lorenz the other day, who sort of uh, is honorary ambassador with, for African parks in Zakuma. It feels like he's a, he's a real lover of, of Zakuma and, and rightly so. It's, it's, it's a unique ecosystem. And, you know, this, this image I took was, was one on, on foot. So a lot of what you do is, is walking around. It feels wild. It feels like no other part of Africa that I visited up until to that point you are there as a small group and, and really no other tourists are there, no other photographers are there, very few photographers had visited. So it's a pretty sort of unique and, and inspiring place to visit and just a great way to, to get a sense of what African Parks was doing. It's one which is just has an abundance of life and this image is one which, uh, you know, it, it's not going to win any awards, but it certainly shows what... Uh, why farmers, you know, fear quellia, you're not seeing them in the hundreds or the thousands, but in the millions. Mm -hmm. And they are filling the sky and, and swarming through as well as thousands of black crowned cranes, of pelicans, of other waterfowl. You can see there's a there's a kite chasing the, the quellia through. It really is an amazingly abundant ecosystem. And again, it's an ecosystem where you wouldn't expect it where where Zakuma is located. If you think about Chad, and I didn't know what to expect when I was was planning my trip and, and when I arrived, I was thinking more of the Sahara, which which sort of stretches up to the north, and, and that's very much the case. That's the first taste of Injamina you get is you know the capital city. It's a sort of bustling, reportedly very dangerous city, dusty, but you go into you fly sort of you know south and west to uh, to Zakuma and you you have this amazing sort of abundance of life you know with then the the rainforest band of, of ecosystems sort of stretching to the to the south and so yeah the bird life is incredible the noise that fills the air is is incredible um but it's messy so I'm a keen photographer uh you know I was listening to uh to um uh Marcel the other day and and his focus on you know, very clean images and I thought you know anyone with OCD is really going to, to struggle in uh, in, in uh, Zakuma it's it's not only sort of noisy it's hot incredibly dusty the sky is filled with dust so much so that the the you know the sunsets really just sort of disappear before you get any sort of golden light and the sky is just messy again and birds are filling every scene so it can be challenging to, to kind of get um, really good good phot photographs but Nevertheless, hopefully this sort of illustrates why African parks identified Zakuma as a, a key, you know, national park in which they, they wanted to protect. And, you know, there's very unique sort of species there, including these, these giraffes. These are corphodon giraffe. And Zakuma houses 
or homes 50% of the population. So, you know, and that number's only into the thousands. So it really is is a key ecosystem as well as sort of, you know, the Fasa water bark, you know, the harder beast, all of the other species, cob, buffalo, that, that inhibit the, uh, or habitat the, the, the environment. It really is a, a special place. But I think the, one of the key animals that um, probably act as the biggest ambassadors are Zakuma's elephants. And that's really the story of, of Zakuma in a large way. In 2002, it was estimated that there was probably around sort of four and a half to 5,000 elephants in, in Zakuma. What you saw over the next eight years was really just a mass slaughter of elephants. Um, tragic, but 90% of the population of, of elephants in Zakuma was, was killed and, and persecuted. And sadly, you know, that was largely as a result of sort of, you know, uh, guns for ivory. Uh, you had sort of both, I think, probably local, uh, local population coming in and, and slaughtering the elephants, but you also had conflict in Darfur and Sudan, sort of in, in neighboring countries. And that really sort of destabilized uh, this part of the world. And every year, the, the sort of, you know, the National Park Service would come back and find more and more elephant carcass. And they essentially got down to 450 50 elephants. Since 2010, when African parks came in, they have really been able to stop that poaching. And it came at the loss of the life of, of rangers. Um, mm -hmm. So it has been a, a tragic story from both a, a human perspective and also from an elephant perspective. My personal experience was one of just being blown away by the experience of, of being with these elephants. You can go and visit the park headquarters. I think I would have spent all day, every day there almost, take a hose and stand watering these bull elephants. And they, you know, people say that elephants, you know, never for, forget and clearly they must forgive because to be able to sort of tolerate uh, humans in that way, either they were just incredibly thirsty and it was 45 degrees, but I think there was sort of an understanding that, you know what what people have been able to come in and do is is good for good for them and good for the environment and fortunately you started to see the the, the herd and it's uh, you know through fear and stress all of the elephants in, in Zakuma really formed one large herd except for the some of these these bull males who are off on their own um incredibly well behaved as well there's not many places i think you get three bulls sort of lined up patiently waiting to drink water out of a hose <laughs> So again, it's, uh, it's an incredible experience. And that's and then, something that uh, a visitor could do, or is it for you as like a director of AP that you would get this <laughs> experience? At the time, I wasn't a director, so I was a, I was a visitor. So I would like to uh, promote Zakuma on the basis that it's it's not guaranteed. It's up to the elephants whether they turn up. It's, mm -hmm. it's obviously uh, not encouraged to be encountering sort of wildlife in these ways, but you know, there's. There's very few water sources in, in the park. And so, you know, an easy water source and a clean water source is to, to drink from the hose. So, you know, if you're an elephant, why not? Yeah, uh, if, you're a, if you're a tourist, <laughs> it's, as I said, I've, you know, I've never been up, up close and, and, you know, been able to touch a wild elephant like that uh, anywhere, anywhere else. So it's a, I keep saying it's a pretty u unique uh, experience. And what I was saying is, you know, the herd's also sort of stabilized and hopefully with the protection of African parks. Is, is really benefiting. The, the herd is breeding again. They're seeing young calves being born each year. And that's clearly a good sign for the, for the future of, um, of Zakuma. And the, you know, I think the, the model, again, a private partnership model is one which is, is done with agreement with the governments in which African Parks goes in and, and manages these areas. And through that relationship and through the benefit and the stabilization of Zakuma, um, not only has uh, Zakuma's mandate been extended, but also um, African Parks has been able to take control over nearby sort of corridors and other uh, areas of, of Chad where these elephants sort of will, will move to, together with, with Entity, which is uh, on my list of, of places I would like to go as well, sort of, you know, from a landscape, stone arches, it, it looks a, a stunning place, but I, I didn't have the chance to, to go there. But you asked about being a tourist, Marion, and tourism is a part of it. Tourism is a part of all of the, the African Park sort of models. I think not all parks will be able to accept tourists. Tourists, you know, security is obviously a big issue in, in many places. I've been to the DRC. It's a, a really challenging place. You know, mm -hmm. African parks have a presence in Garumba. I think for some time there was questions as to whether that would continue. But ultimately, you know, a big part of what makes African parks 
successful as being tenacious and for being organized and for committing to, to work in very challenging environments in very challenging circumstances. But as a tourist, when you visit uh, Zakuma, um, there's three camps. There's Camp Nomad, which is sort of where I think most of the Western tourists will, will visit. You're essentially sleeping under the sky, stars. It's a brilliant sky. There is, you know, no light pollution from, from anywhere nearby. So you, you get an amazing view and it's, you know, one where lion come and visit you at night and, you know, you have some amazing night drives to see, you know, civets and serval and porcupine. It's mind blowing again in terms of the wildlife that exists there. Um, sadly, one of the night drives, we did a, a leopard wandered through camp just after we'd left. So we didn't see no. a leopard when we were there, but, you know, as, as, as oh, ironic. <laughs> it's actually, you go out looking for them and they're sort of laughing at you. But uh, you really have a chance to see a lot of wildlife. There's even cheetah. African Parks has reintroduced rhino. Sadly, some uh, didn't fare so well, um, but you know, there's there's still a couple of rhino there. Um, but again, there's just so much to, to see and do. Mm. But a big part of the African Parks model as well is, as you said up front, Marion, is, is doing it for the local communities. And mm. a couple of the camps are really set up to be able to accept uh, local communities to, to come through and the local population to visit. And, you know, we bumped into to this, uh, you know, game viewer, um, a little more crowded than, than our vehicle, but it was great to see so many happy and smiling faces, you know, taking photos. Actually, at this point, it was a, of a waterhole, you know, with, with crocodiles. You know, it's really important to get the buy-in of the, of, the uh, of the local communities. And I think not just in Sakuma, but throughout African, other African parks, parks you, you really see that. And you see the, the, the communities being able to come in and, and benefit from the, from the parks. Um, but it's not just the, the sort of tourism angle, but it's also the local communities. And we had a really special encounter with some of the nomadic uh, people, and uh, especially these, these kids who are incredibly welcoming, incredibly friendly. Um, you know, African parks have set up 17 schools around Sakuma. So when people support, you know, African parks, it's not just supporting the wildlife. It's not just supporting these wild places and keeping it, you know, unique and intact as, as ecosystems, but also deriving benefit for the local communities. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, I studied economics at university. I work in investment world and finance. I really sort of see the, the economic side of, of the argument. And for these parks to be sustainable, you need to have an economic value to them and you need to see the benefit. And that's where having education, having access to health, having employment opportunities is really just a fantastic sort of element of what African Parks does and why I think the model again is, is successful. The, the One of the sort of waiters who served us at dinner when we were in the camp, he's ended up becoming a guide and is fully employed and, you know, by, by, the, by the team there. I, I love hearing these stories, but just seeing sort of the, the local community and their willingness to sort of see and accept sort of tourists in what's essentially their lands is, is, is just sort of, you know, really important to see. And, you know, it, it's, how the model, it's how the model works. And in particular, you know, I was struck by a lot of the local communities sort of, they were asking for both water vessels, so sort of containers to be able to hold water and injections. So they see that, you know, kids who are vaccinated, you know, are generally sort of healthier and, and survive. And I don't want to go into the whole COVID world, but clearly, you know, some of the benefits of, of health is, is there. And, you know, Zakuma is the biggest employer in the, in the region. So, you know, you set up health clinics, you set up schools, you employ people, employed people rely on markets to, to you know, buy food, you know, re rely on drivers, rely on the waiters, the staff, you know, in the, in the camp. It's, it really becomes a, a sort of very holistic sort of uh, environment in which the, in which the camp can, can operate. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the employment is like 95% local in the parks that African Parks manages, which is also quite incredible because it does give back to local people and it does involve them as well actively, right? Yeah, you need to see if you're local, I can see that, you know, if you're collecting wood for charcoal, if you're, you know, collecting, you know, or poaching for bushmeat, all of these things, you if that gets taken away from you, why you have to ask those questions but if on the other side you can see that there's employment that your children have better health that they have a better chance through education 
you know, that really justifies African parks and, and what they're doing. That's not to say mm -hmm. it's easy. That definitely comes with it a lot of challenges. And you certainly see that across all of the areas. And I'll chat more about Odzala, a big part of, you know, Odzala and the people who surround the park come from, from sort of bushmeat, uh, you know, protein comes from bush, bush meat, you know, uh, poaching. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's something that they have to really, uh, really kind of manage. But maybe yeah, if, if you're talking about Otsana, I don't know, I, I think you're not finished with uh, Sakuma yet, but uh, Silke has to leave in like 10 minutes. And okay. she would love to hear about Otsana because she's planned a trip. So she's oh, going wow. there next January. Um, and she wanted to know if you have any insider tips apart from seeing gorillas, of course. So maybe if that's okay, you skip by the Ruto yeah. and go to Otsana first. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So Otsana is sort of a... It's sort of the polar opposite in a way of Zakuma in that this is now in the rainforest area. It's, it's part of the Congo Basin. You know, the Congo Basin is the second largest rainforest on the planet. You know, it's always described as the Earth's lungs, and it is just critical that we as a population really preserve this area. But it's also an incredible place to, to explore. And a lot of that exploration is done either on foot or by boat. Uh, it's nice to sort of spend a couple of weeks not being on Sorry, I'm in central London, so you may hear a little bit of noise <laughs> near a bit of a uh, hospital as well. So get uh, buzzed by ambulances. It's it's not quite pure Africa. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and someone wants my attention, it seems. But um, yeah, you know, when you explore, it really feels like a great way to sort of disconnect from the world, which, which I'm in now and, and live in, and you really get away from it. And it, it's also one which allows you in a way to, to sort of get closer to nature, I think, when you're not in a vehicle. It, it, it lends itself to a, a really different feel. And so a lot of th those encounters, as I said, come on foot. And that includes the, the lowland gorillas. And there are approximately sort of, um, I think it's around 7,000 Western lowland gorillas in the broader Odzala ecosystem. Odzala stretches to sort of 13,000 you know, square kilometers. So I think the, the Netherlands is sort of almost twice the size of that, just to give you a sense of scale. But it's a huge area. A lot of it is sort of, you know, impossible. It you know, would take a, a long time to explore. But actually, you only need a really small part of, of, the, of the ecosystem to really explore. And that's going along the riverways, exploring the by the sort of open clearings on foot and, and venturing into the, to the jungle to see uh, the gorillas. Somewhat ironically, and for those of you who've maybe seen the gorillas or visited them in Rwanda or Uganda, similar sort of setup, you have to wear masks. I went to Odzala right at the beginning of you know, March in 2020. So came back to a world where wearing masks again was commonplace, but sort of got a, a warm up act in, in, the, in Odzala because clearly you don't want to you know, transmit any human diseases to the, to the gorilla population. Um, but it's not just the gorillas, there are chimpanzees, other monkeys, this is one of the black and white colobus monkeys that, that we encountered. Um, some really unique species, the gray mangabees. This is a Debraza uh, monkey. I just thought such an endearing face and one hard not to, hard not to love. But in addition to, to exploring on foot and, and by boat, you explore on kayak. And one of my great memories was kayaking down uh, one of the rivers and encountering this elephant who was not particularly happy to have been interrupted in his meal by us on bright orange kayaks. And he gave us a good trumpet and splash uh, before moving on his way and got some cool photos. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty a pretty sort of uh, memorable experience. And, and again, it's just a park which is filled with that. So not even these big iconic species, but also sort of things you've never encountered in other places, Red River Hog, Giant Forest Hog, Bongo and Sitatunga. You never know quite what you, you you're going to encounter, and and one of my favourite encounters, uh, which was my submission for Prince for Wildlife. Uh, actually, I'm skipping a photo, but um, was uh, and I'll skip to that photo. This was another elephant that we came across on on foot, but um, was uh, was this hyena, and hyenas are the the top predator in Odzala. You'd never guess it. The population is is essentially um, isolated from all other populations of, of hyena um, throughout Africa. These are, you know, spotted hyena that you'd more commonly see sort of on, on safari and in, in other areas. As I said, this was my submission for, for uh, Prince of Wildlife last year. So hopefully a few people maybe have it hanging on their wall. It really felt like sort of the, the Garden of Eden. But the, the hyena number sort of upwards of nearly 100. And 
as the top predator, they, they're preying on the, the forest buffalo, which was my uh, prior slide, who were our welcoming committee coming back into camp uh, each night almost, a little bit less uh, daunting than their Cape buffalo cousins and have this red tinged color to them. But the buffalo are uh, preyed upon by, by these, uh, by these uh, hyena. The elephants are either rep also reportedly preyed upon by, um, by the hyena. There's, there's camera trap footage sh showing the sort of hyena sort of chasing after, after these forest buffaloes. So they're really unique. Sadly, lion don't exist anymore. There used to be localized sort of populations. Those were sadly sort of hunted out, I think, into the 1990s. There are leopard, but uh, traveling through the, the forest is, is not one which is particularly easy on foot, nor doing it sort of quietly. So it's always a bit of a, a challenge. And I think you only ever see what the the, the environment wants you to, to see. So, um, you know. Always, yeah. Yeah. Nature provides. But I think Silke, she says she's really excited to see Otsala. And she also said it might be the only time where she loves wearing masks. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely worth it and Silke, please feel free to drop me a message on instagram or connect me through marion i'd be very happy to give you any tips that you may need for for traveling there and what to expect uh photography tips if there's anything that that can be helpful uh, honestly i would i would love to go back i think if i if i didn't have a family and kids to have got back to it would have been one where being stuck there through through covid wouldn't have been the worst place in the world to have, to have been so yeah Thank you so much, Matt, for offering it. Uh, for all of you guys, I have put Matt's uh, Instagram account in the chat right at the top. So if you want to connect with him, please uh, feel free to, to follow him and link up on Instagram. Yeah, very happy to, to answer any questions here or, or directly as well. So I thought, um, given that quick sort of uh, skip forward to Adzala, maybe we'd go back to, um, to Bazarutu, which is... Um, you know, as I said, the, one of African parks, marine parks. And, you know, it's been a national park for almost 50 years. Um, you know, it was identified uh, by African parks as a, another key ecosystem. And the government of Mozambique invited African parks in in, in 2017. It's about 1,400 square kilometers with, with five islands, three of which are, are populated. Um, so Benguera is, is where most of the tourists, uh, tourists sit. It's, it's an easy island to sort of explore, um, not only getting out onto the water and, and going diving and snorkeling and, and seeing the sort of marine life, but also on the island itself. And fun fact, uh, it, these lakes are actually freshwater lakes and filled with freshwater crocodiles. Um, so as enticing as they maybe look like, you know, wanting a break from the saltwater environment, not a good place to, uh, to go swimming, but one which is, is fantastic to explore. There's some of the, the smaller creatures that you can find, including these uh, Sunni antelope, which are, which are localized. Um, mm -hmm. But it's one, as a, as a sort of park, it's one where, you know, you have to step back and, and look at what African parks mandate really is. And, and that's really around sort of five action pillars. That's focusing on management and infrastructure, putting in place really good governance and really good management to, to oversee these parks. Many of the parks that, that African parks, you know, go in and take over are underfinanced, undermanaged. Um, the infrastructure is, is not sort of there and in a robust form. And it relies on African parks to, to inject that. And to inject that, you really need good management, good infrastructure. Um, you obviously need funding. And that's where, you know, the Prince for Wildlife campaign comes in. And I'll chat more about that as well. Um, but, you know, biodiversity and conservation is another pillar community development and we've chatted about the, the schools and employment initiatives are, are amazing to, to see, but also law enforcement. And, you know, I mentioned the poaching, which is both an issue in, in Takuma and fortunately no, uh, no elephants have been poached in recent years. There's still a problem in Odzala, you know, it's a harder area to police. So there is still some limited poaching and, and poachers camps uh, dismantled some bushmeat poaching. But African Parks, again, is doing an incredible job getting in there to both educate and make people aware and, and prevent that. But in, in Bazarutu, it's really all around, um, all around sort of, uh, you know, uh, fishing and illegal fishing and particular gill nets. And so, you know, you see, you see the local population going out and fishing. One of the big elements of what African Parks tries to do is through education and communication and, and, and engage with these, uh, with these fishermen. And actually, most of the local community get on board because 
if you stop the sort of poaching of fish and other wildlife, there's actually more to, to go around for everybody and, and the fishing take actually sort of increases. So it's generally seen sort of as a good thing and there's times of the year where actually the, the local community stops fishing to allow the fishing stocks to, to really sort of be, be repopulated. Um, obviously it's a marine ecosystem. The best way to see a lot of that is to get in the water. You have, I think, five different turtle species. There's around 2,000 fish species. You have whales, you have dolphins, you have sharks, uh, manta rays. In particular, there's dugongs. We saw them. I didn't get a good photo. I didn't get any photo, actually. Um, but it is the last sort of viable population of, of dugong on the, on the East African coast. So, again, the protection that African parks affords in places like Azarutu is, is really just you know, uh, key for, for sort of these, these types of types of species. So I think there's going to be more to come from uh, African parks on the, on the dugong and, and the recent surveys. So hopefully there'll be more photos to be shared. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you with a, a photo of uh, one of the turtles that I encountered and, and a moray eel, which uh, I saw on, on one of my dives. So just to give a, a little bit of a, a sense of, of what, what is happening there. But again, it's an important place for tourism. Um, and it's probably the most comfortable and sort of relaxing place to, to be a tourist when you visit one of the African parks. It's sort of five-star luxury, you know, turquoise waters, you know, white sand beaches, and you can enjoy it sipping a cocktail, you know, by the beach, but you can also, you know, get out exploring all that the, the park has to offer. Um, I chatted about Odzala and, and maybe just conscious of, of time and wanting to take other questions, would all uh, love to uh, take you to the, the next park, which was my most recent visit, which is Matusa Donna in, in Zimbabwe. Um, and again, it's, a, it's one of the newer parks that African Parks has, has taken over. Um, it's a park which came into the portfolio in, in, 2000 and, in 2019. And when I say portfolio, it's really important point to note that African Parks is an NGO. This is not a commercial enterprise. You know, African Parks does this for the long-lasting benefit of, again, local communities, their populations, does so on a public-private partnership basis, so in conjunction with the government. They manage and look after control of, of all of the elements of the, you know, as I said, the management infrastructure, biodiversity and conservation, community development, law enforcement, and also the tourism enterprise to want to be able to sort of generate tourism revenues to put back into the park, but it is all going back into the, into the park. And the way that works and, and the role I have as a director of African parks is to try and represent AP in the, in the UK, find new donors, talk to people about African parks. A lot of the donors that African parks have have been very uh, either high profile, wealthy institutions, large institutions, the EU is a supporter and donor, US Fish and Wildlife. Some of these are on a restricted basis. They're for particular projects, for particular areas, very targeted in their approach. Um, what is key for African parks is, is funding for all of the parks across all of the areas of the you know, community development, law enforcement. These are, this is a photo of, of two of the ranges I encountered in the Tusadona, making sure the ranges are, are kitted out, uh, prepared for a what is a rugged, tough environment in which they, they operate. And that funding needs to come from, from you know, institutions, from individuals. And that was how I got involved. I sort of wanted to be part of that and wanted to give back. I think suddenly as a photographer, it feels like you're always quite selfish. You, you're taking something, you're enjoying it, you're getting a lot of enjoyment for it. And I wanted to give back. And so I you know, made a donation to African Parks and that started a a long conversation with them, which led to them asking me to, to sort of help set up African parks in the UK in, in 2020. And sometimes feels like a, a job. It's one which I love love doing. Obviously, it's an unpaid job and you're a volunteer, but it really takes all of us to, to really care about the, the world in which we live in, the, the environment in which we, we all see. Not all, all of us will get to, to visit these places. I feel incre incredibly privileged to be able to have been to so far, four parks, and I hope to be able to visit more. Marion, I know you've been to Akagera and Nungwe, so you can you can add your your take there. But it really it's important, I think, as well as photographers, that we show that these places exist, that they're not forgotten about. And 
you know, we started talking off a little bit about the, the 30 parks by 2030, you know, model. And that's a key objective of African parks. They, they managed to get to uh, 20 parks by 2022, so slightly delayed. We're hoping, you know, there's a number of new parks in the pipeline, so we're hoping for, for more good news. But overall, you know, African parks have you know, done an analysis of, of the wild areas throughout um, Africa, and there's around 161 parks which um, and, and areas sort of landscapes which really require intervention. There's probably 40 or so of those which have a, a management plan in place, but there's probably 90 or so parks which, which really need intervention and need groups like African Parks and others to, to kind of step in and, and provide that support. And that's where Prince for Wildlife and other campaigns really are a massive benefit where hopefully, you know, people on this call and who are, buying prints, you know, can feel satisfied that they're doing their piece to, to preserve, you know, these areas and doing so with some hopefully beautiful and accessible art on their on their wall. But let me take you a little bit through Matusa Donna as well. So, you know, we got to spend time with the with the ranger population, uh, ranger team rather. Here they were showing us the, the kit that they go out on multi-day patrols with, you know, a backpack, you know, mosquito nets, uh, sort of a, a basic roll mat, sleeping bag, water filtration devices, obviously survival uh, medical kits as well and, and, and their, their rifles, which hopefully they don't have to use uh, too often. But, you know, Matusa Donna is a, is a national park which has been played by, by poaching over the years. There used to be rhino no longer. It's a somewhat artificial environment in that in the 1950s, the Zambezi River was, was dammed uh, to provide hydroelectricity for Zimbabwe and, and Zambia. And it created what is one of the largest sort of man-made kind of lakes and reservoirs in the world in, in Lake Kariba. And so as a result, you know, a lot of wildlife was, was sort of push, pushed up. There's a great story, if anyone has time, of, of something called Operation Noah. It was around six, 7,000 animals were rescued in this time. Sort of, you go back and see these 1950s clips and photographs of, you know, volunteers going in and darting rhino with sedatives to be able to strap them onto to rafts to, to sort of put them back to shore to capturing snakes, which doesn't sound like a lot of fun, to you know, all sorts of species and, and trying to sort of rescue them at that point in time. But that was the genesis of of sort of Matusa Donna and, and the park's named after the the rolling hills that you see in the background. But again, it's a marine environment, but not a marine, a water-based environment. Fishing is a big part of it. And, and, and the rivers, uh, river and, and the, the lake itself is, is a huge source of food for the local populations. But with that comes poaching of, of the fish. And so this is uh, the collection of boats at the park headquarters of, of African parks. Anyone knows, has any good ideas as to what to do with these these boats? I think the the team's all all ideas and and very open to to any su suggestions. So hopefully um, uh, something will be done done with these plastic, like in uh, Bazarutu, is is also a problem. And you know plastic bottles, I think you know plague us uh, over the over the planet. Again, the park is African Parks is doing a great job of of cleaning up and. And working to um, you know try and sort of preserve the, the park, um, schooling, providing schools. It was great to see you know kids in school in class, learning their ABCs and, and language, you know maths, but also learning about the park and the, the ecosystem. I thought my kids would love this playground. Actually, it looked a, a pretty good setup, colourful, um, and one which again it was just heartwarming to actually see that you know what African Park says it. Said it, says it is doing in terms of you know, community support is actually is really there and so it's important to, to see but with you know the flooding came the sunken forest and so these are the Matusa Donna hills that, that rise up beyond the lake and you get a strip of, of land sort of savanna grass and, and forest where you find most of the wildlife today there's a number of camps there which have opened up um, you can stay on houseboat like I did not a place if you're a sleepwalker it is full of crocodiles hippos are <laughs> A, a big, uh, a big, uh, in big number there, and a, a big grazing. Um, these are some of the impala grazing on the water side. The the elephants as well are, are truly sort of special to see with some brilliant lights. The lake in the backdrop, the hills behind, really just a, an amazing uh, environment in which to see. But 
the population of wildlife there has also needed a helping hand. So not only in the 1950s being rescued as the, as the lake flooded and the valley filled, but also more recently because of you know poaching. And these are some of the, the zebra which have been introduced and reintroduced. So I think there was around 270 uh, or 220 uh, zebra which came into the park in, in 2021 donated from a, a game reserve down the down the road so they're settling into their new home and, and it was it was lovely to uh, lovely to uh, to see predators are always popular to see sorry for those who don't like the the gore but um, uh, you know we were lucky enough to, to spot a, a, a leopard one morning who we interrupted on its evening uh, kill of, a, of an impala you know the panthera has done a study that there's around four leopards per hundred uh, square kilometers so uh, and as those who've visited Africa and, and sort of wild places they're not always the easiest cats to find so you have to have a little bit of luck like uh, like anything else uh, that, that goes with with wildlife viewing but we were lucky on on that morning um the elephants again amazing to photograph but also a cause of human wildlife conflict and that's one of the challenges that the team on the ground really face and so they have been collaring some of the elephants in in uh Matusadona, looking at where these elephants uh move around to moving in and out of the park but also moving in and out of sort of human uh population areas and so a big part of what African Parks is doing is trying to work with the local communities to sort of mitigate those, those threats. No one wants their crop raided. Fencing works until you get a really hungry elephant and until you get a really hungry elephant that knows how to get through a fence. And so they're coming up with sort of interesting and uh, amazing ideas to sort of you know, prevent the elephants to come. And that includes sort of growing and, and sort of um, burning chili bricks um, the elephants don't like their, their vegetables or, you know, spicy, it seems. And so chili is a great deterrent. You have stories in other parts of Africa and Malawi where they use bees. Again, elephants don't love the bees. The byproduct of being able to produce chili, but being able to produce um, uh, honey, mm. these are the things that, again, African Parks works to, to try and do. But it's very much just a, a beautiful landscape. The sunken forest reminded me of, of Namibia and Dead Vlei that you can see in the Slossus Vlei area of, of Namibia. Um, elephants on the shoreline at night in golden lights. You know, it is beautiful. But I'm going to, conscious of time, and Marion, I feel like I've done a lot of talking, so happy to take <laughs> questions, take any questions that you have, and leave it on the Twitter, which is my submission for, uh, for Prince for Wildlife this year, and, and hope that it may be a a popular purchase, but again, a way that people can can support African parks and and you know contribute on their level, um, you know, with with getting something on their wall as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. It was lovely listening to your stories and watching the photos from these parks and getting to know a bit more about African parks. Very diverse kind of uh, not only portfolio but also challenges and diverse projects and what they have to to deal with in all of these areas and then yeah. of course thank you for donating this photo <laughs> which is an incredible beautiful shot uh, from from Amboseli in Kenya just to mention that as well so that's uh, not yeah. one of the African parks uh, parks but uh, maybe next year we'll get one if you go, get to Akagera in Nyungwe maybe we'll have another yeah. shot of otherwise I still have to hang my uh, my photo from last year I've still got my oh. hanging in myself just to to put so it's all framed and ready to go but i need to find a place on the wall so uh yeah they, they definitely look great framed there's so many amazing photos in the collection again this year with the catalog out i really enjoyed going through a lot of the other images and yeah. it's i think it's just a great way to you know to to support african parks it requires care from all of us it requires awareness from all of us of the planet that we live in you know these these activities of groups like African Parks don't just happen in isolation. It, you know, requires all of us, even if we can't sort of support it financially or through buying a, a print, but just by talking about it and being aware of it, following along on Instagram and, and supporting, all of this, this really does help. And, and that's what we, we need sort of from everyone and more people. Yeah, thank you so much for, for mentioning that because we've also discussed before this uh, talk a little bit that it seems maybe like a drop in the bucket what Prince for Wildlife does for such a big operation that, that African Parks is, but it's not. It really does create awareness. It does create a 
kind of a, a knowledge about how critical the work is that has been done in, in, in these parks. And uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit like why it's important for people to support African parks, even if it's not by purchasing a print, even if it's just by talking and by sharing the message. What, what does it create? Like what's that awareness level creating? Yeah, I think it's channels. I mean, I think, you know, if you speak to anyone about the Af on the African parks team, they will tell you that if you lose these places, you lose these places forever. And you know, through the team and you know, spending time with them in Matusadana, I saw some incredible satellite imagery of national parks, which are national parks on paper. They don't exist in practice. There is farming, there is human settlements in these areas. And once they go, it's going to be very difficult to, um, you know, to, to, to retain these parks and to, uh, enable them to, to exist in the future. And, you know, if you go to the Congo Basin, you know, it is just a massive store of carbon, um, both through the trees, but also through peat. If you destroy that, again, you lose that forever and, and that's impossible. And so, again, I think we as individuals who care about the environment, there are so many causes that we can support. And, you know, I, I've supported many over, over time before I got involved with African parks. Just having an awareness, talking to people about it, you know, being prepared to support campaigns such as Prince for Wildlife, sign up to sort of, you know, campaigns to get laws changed, to, you know, help, you know, drive and support these areas across many different elements of, of, of sort of, you know, conservation. It all goes a long way to, to sort of making, hopefully, you know, the world we live in a better place and to protecting these places that, then if we lose them, we lose them forever. And you know, I think there's, there's there's discussions about you know trying to preserve 30% of the world for for nature, and you know it's important for biodiversity. You know Africa needs to do its bit. I'm Australian. Australia needs to do its bit. You have to see it in, in South America, in the US, in Europe. It's it's a really global global challenge that we all face. But I think when you when you sort of peel the lid back on what a group like African Parks does, you just realize it's so multidimensional. And again, there's so many stories which hopefully will come out through the Prince for Wildlife campaign, but also just, you know, through the general channels that you need to make people aware of. And, and you know, that's where hopefully inspiring people with beautiful, beautiful photographs and photographers sharing their fortunate privilege experiences of being in the bush really go a long way. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, I think I cannot add anything to it. So um, please, you guys feel free to, if you have any more questions to to let us know now. We have maybe a few more minutes left uh, in this uh, live chat. And uh, in the meantime, maybe let me add that because you showed this beautiful frame print, that this year we're actually offering frame prints for the first time. So uh, there will be an, a beautiful offer of white or black or oak colored FSC certified. So um, it's a wood that comes from sustainable sources. So it's really also nicely done the way uh, these will be framed. And then they are shipped ready to hang. So no more hassle. In, in, I don't know how much of a hassle it was for you, Matt, to, to find a frame for, for yours. <laughs> it's not so simple. Yeah, it can be it can be a challenge, and there's always so much uh, choice to to make. Now I'm just struggling with wall space. I sort of you know have a number of my other photos up, but uh, I'll, I'll find a spot. But for for the moment, I like being able to sort of lift it up and, and show it to people beyond. But uh, and I love that you that you mention wall space because then I have to add they make for incredible gifts, and we've had so many beautiful stories of people gifting prints to their family, loved ones, to friends. So. This is also something here I'm talking, we're still not open. So <laughs> we have to wait for, for Sunday until the, the print sale starts, but uh, the countdown is on. So it's only three more days and we're super excited to, to start. Yeah, I use um, them as gifts. So uh, that was a, a big way of, for me was using this thank you gifts last year and, and being able to not only buy my own prints, but, but you know, other prints of other photographers and, is really again a, an incredible collection of images coming through this year so i think i'll be finding more wall space to to try and hang some of these and again using it as a, a good way to to say thank you to, to to many sort of other supporters out there yeah wonderful thank you and we do have a question now from uh, karl heinz maybe you can answer that one uh it's about uh Kafu, which is the recent or latest addition to to african parks like how did the takeover go and what is changing there 
Yeah, and so, you know, African Parks has actually had a presence on the ground for a couple of years now in Kafuri with a sort of uh, a bridging management sort of um, agreement with the government. But it really took, you know, we were standing waiting for uh, African Parks and the government to sign and, and it was really I think on the on the Zambian sign that we kept getting told it was getting closer and closer and closer and and finally I wasn't involved in those discussions but I think uh, you know uh, patience is a virtue right and, and finally it has been been part of it so I've not been I actually had thought and hoped to, to get up there in um, uh, in June when I was visiting uh, Matusa Donna but the logistics didn't quite uh, quite work out it, it's it's a park that you can sort of you know um, uh, get to quite easily, but uh, for me coming through from Zimbabwe, it wasn't uh, being, being sort of time poor. It wasn't uh, going to work, unfortunately. But I, I hope to get out there. It's, it looks like a, an incredible place to see. Yeah, I haven't been myself. I've been to Serbia, but uh, only to the eastern part, Lower Zambezi and South Luangwa. So I've yet to go. But if I go, I would combine it with Liwa Plains and then kind of see the two parks and maybe even Bangwilo Wetlands, which is, I think, very iconic for the shoe bills. So there was a great image last year of the shoe. I think it was last year of the shoe bills. Yes. And yeah. I would love to see that. I, I tried in Uganda, but was unsuccessful. But I, I do love the. I showed you the messy photos from sort of Odzala and Zakuma. I love the sort of open spaces. And I think, yeah, getting getting into some of those grasslands and seeing the lechwe and, you know, in the, in the waterways, yeah. it, it looks pretty, pretty incredible. So uh, I'll be jealous if you get there before I do, Marion. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if I beat you to that. I did beat you to Akagera in Nyungwe, so. <laughs> yeah, and that was an amazing experience, right? Yeah, no, it was incredible to see, right? I mean, we've, when we did the first edition of Prince Wildlife, both P and I, we had planned to go to one of the African parks parks, but we haven't been yet. So this was the first time for us to really see the work on the ground. And as you said before, it's like easy to see the photos and kind of get an idea of what they do. But when you're on the ground and really see the enthusiasm, you know, of a class of school kids being brought to the park for the first time. And this happens every day in Akagera. And they are in the bus and they see, you know, the hippos and they see whatever they see, yeah, you know, don't know what, what nature provides, but they are so amazed by it. And they see nature through different eyes all of a sudden, and they see that it's worth protecting it. And then, you know, the whole cycle closes. They will tell the parents and the parents will tell the neighbors. And it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So and yeah. I look sorry. <laughs> the rhinos driving the rhinos which were reintroduced into the parks, you know, driving through the streets of Rwanda and school kids out singing and welcoming them essentially. And but also the story of like, you know, the, the fish farm and, and the sort of the revenue generated is, is really yeah. it's not just tourism, but it's actually sort of you know making sure there's a sustainable livelihood, sort of, you know, production of honey. You know, Nyungwe, I know, is a source of, of water for the country. I mean, it's there's there's so many elements that, that make up these parks. So, yeah, I'm with you. I've, I've been to Rwanda, but I need to, to get down there at some point and, and see those two parks. Yeah, you'll be amazed. It's uh, quite fantastic. Um, yeah, I think that, that brings us to the, the end of today's live session. It was uh, lovely having you. Thank you so much for giving us uh, all these insights into African Parks work and all of your personal experiences in the park parks. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's going to entice all of us, not just to look at the prints and the photos, but maybe also travel there one day if we, we get the chance. So yeah, of course, we're pri privileged if we can get to, but uh, yeah, it's definitely on the list now. <laughs> Yeah, well, I hope you're all very privileged to be able to do so and, and lucky enough to share some of the experiences that I have. But again, you know, I welcomed everyone who, uh, you know, have joined to, to follow up if they have other questions or if I ex can expand on anything further. Also, I know the African Parks team are always happy to chat. There's great information on the website. But also make sure to follow along with the Prince for Wildlife campaign because there's just going to be great content coming through in and around that. So uh, let's bring on Sunday and... Thanks to Marion and P for everything they've done for starting this off and all of the team. And yeah, let's hope it's another successful campaign. So thank you for hosting me as well today. Thank you again. And uh, this brings us to the end of all the um, live sessions of this year. Please do stay tuned for whatever is happening on uh, the website and on Instagram. And also please make sure to follow African Parks because there's, of course, much more stories to be told and African Parks has 
great Instagram uh, content as well, sharing all these stories. So thank you again for joining and uh, have a lovely evening or a lovely day wherever you are based and see you soon. <laughs> Thanks, Marion. Thanks, everyone, for your support. Thank you, bye.